In October 1972, my husband, our two babies, my brother, and I left Leavenworth, Kansas in our 1968 Volkswagen van on a camping trip to a recreational area in Arkansas called Beaver Lake. When we finally got there, we found a fairly remote campsite at the far end of the park. We wanted to be alone as the babies woke often during the night and needed to feed. We didn't want to disturb any other campers. Shortly after pulling into our campsite, my brother pitched his tent next to the van. The rest of us were going to sleep in the van. The campsite was in an area with a horseshoe-shaped, rocky, terraced ledge that rose from around 50 feet to around 100 feet as it curved around behind the four campsites. Because of mature trees and thick brush, Daylight had trouble poking into our spot. Fast forward to that night, sometime around 3.30 a.m., I heard some animal sounds on the ridge that I thought were being made by coyotes. The babies were asleep and all was quiet otherwise. I peered out the window, but still couldn't see what was making the sounds, because it was so dark. Still hearing odd yips and howls, I laid back down on the back seat. Moments later... There was a huge crashing bang on the van wall, right next to my head. My husband leaped up out of a full sleep. My brother bolted out of his tent and jumped into the van with us. We were all in a panic, looking in every direction trying to see what had hit the van like that. My brother finally yelled that he saw something moving behind the van. We all turned, just in time to see a large shadow moving about 20 feet behind the van, from left to right. After about 20 minutes had passed without any of us seeing movement out there, my husband and brother went out to inspect the van for damage, but found none. We then started hearing pounding steps coming from the brush, about 50 feet behind us. The guys eased back into the front seat of the van. That's when my husband turned on the headlights and stepped on the brake pedal for rear light. Instantly, there was a huge commotion. He started the engine, and that's when, in the glow of the headlights, we could see a hairy thing, ten feet away and coming towards the van. As it got closer, its silver-tipped hair glistened in the light. It had a grayish streak from its shoulders, down its back, to its buttocks. The creature was walking on two legs, was around seven or eight feet tall, had a barrel chest and skinny legs. It never gave us a good view of its eyes, so I can't tell you what they looked like. I could see that the face was not ape-like. It was dog-like. Its ears had tufts of fur on the tips of them, and it was very human-like in its movements and general body structure. It moved smoothly and quickly around to the back of the van, where it followed the base of the ridge away from us. That's when it let out a menacing huff and a low, rumbling growl, like a dog. Insanely, my husband and brother bolted from the van, trying to get a better look. That's when a shower of gravel came at us. My husband and brother tore back into the van and burned up the road getting us out of there. I kept looking out the back window and they looked in the rearview mirrors, but none of us ever saw it again. It just didn't seem like a Sasquatch was what we had seen. It seemed too dog-like in its face and was too slim in its body. I still have PTSD-like feelings to this day due to that encounter. I used to work about 30 miles away from where I live. One night, I had been stuck in heavy traffic coming home. I take Lasix. So after a while, I really had to go to the bathroom. I kept telling myself that I was almost home and tried to hold it until I got there. By the time I got to my exit, I knew I wasn't going to make it to my house. So I pulled up to an area where Fidelity Investments is located and found an area that was isolated. This area is heavily wooded with walking trails and a lot of game, but it is also in a very populated area. I pulled up a little side drive off one of the main roads. 
That little drive is about a hundred feet long, with only room for one car. It went up in elevation and had bushes on the right side, facing the main road. On the left side, there was a guardrail and a view of the valley below. The area up there is huge and isolated, with several buildings that are all spaced out. The place is dark at night, because there are intermittent street lights up there. At night, it's pretty deserted, too. A few cars go through that area, though, because it's a shortcut people use to go from Taylor Mill over to 3L Highway, where there are stores, restaurants, etc. When you're up there, you're above everything around this area. When I stopped, I got out of my car, waited a moment, and looked around to make sure there were no other cars. It was winter, so the bushes between where I was and the road below me didn't have many leaves on them. Because of that, you could see right through them. I was up on this little rise, about 20 or 30 feet above the drive, which was four lanes wide. To the left of me was a street light, and more woods that went down another hill, to the main road. I went to the back of my car and did what I had to do. When I finished, I stood up, and all at once, every hair on my body stood up. I knew I wasn't alone. I scanned the area in front of me and must have heard something behind me, because I turned around and there were three deer standing there, all huddled up together, between my car and the guardrail. They weren't looking at me. They were looking across the road. I looked back over there, and that was when I saw a figure standing between the bushes in front of it and the tree line behind it. It was huge. I stand 5'5". Five five. Some of those bushes were about 6 feet tall, but they only came up to about the collarbone area on this thing, due to the street light to the right of it. About 20 feet away, I was able to get a pretty clean outline of this thing. It had a large, dog-shaped head and pointed ears. I couldn't make out its neck, but I could make out massive shoulders. That's when it growled. It was a deep vibration I could feel in my chest. My body just took over at that point. I have to explain this part of it to you. I worked security for years in California, in the music business. As a woman, I have to really work out and train to defend myself. I kickboxed for eight years and worked out every day. I also trained dogs, mainly Anatolian Shepherds and German Shepherds. Sometimes I have to establish who is the Alpha, and to do that, I get them down, hold them in place, grab them by their ear, and growl until they submit. Then the training can start. So when this thing growled at me, it was just pure instinct. I dropped down to a crouching position and growled back. When I did that, it stopped growling and started sniffing the air. Its snout went up and it turned its head slightly as it was sniffing. It then took a few steps forward. I was still crouched down on all fours and moved forward, still growling at that thing. When I did that, it stopped. I stood up and kept staring right at it. I never broke eye contact with it. Then it slowly stepped back into the tree line, until I couldn't make it out as clearly as before and started to move to the right of me. The deer were still behind me. They were so close I could have reached out and touched them. I waved my arms and told them to get out of there. When I did that, they went back over the guardrail and took off down the hill. That's when I jumped in my car and got out of there as fast as I could. I felt this thing was trying to circle behind me, and I wasn't going to wait around for that. Do I think I scared it? No but I do think I confused it for a couple of minutes, and that gave me time to move. I told my husband about what had happened up there, but I didn't tell him exactly what I saw. He would think I was nuts, and to be honest, I thought I was a little crazy myself until I saw a picture of a dog man. I know there are other things in this world that can't be explained. I've seen them, but this was beyond any of those things. Since this has happened, I can't take that shortcut through that area. My husband took me back over that way once to see the area, 
and I was begging him to get me out of there the whole time. I thought I was going to throw up. The wildlife up there has almost totally disappeared. I never see anything up on the hills anymore. The street I live on is only about one mile or so down the hill from this place, and lately we have seen coyotes on the streets, like they have been chased out and pets here have started to go missing. We've also seen a large, black figure moving through our backyards down here. The dogs throughout the neighborhood go crazy regularly now. People were calling the cops when we saw that large, black figure jumping fences. I'm concerned that it has come down the hill after eating everything up there. I saw a dog man walking along the green belt in Boise, Idaho, and to be more specific, the area would be Garden City. The actual location on the green belt would be the area of the green belt that is just on the other side of Veterans Parkway Bridge. For those not familiar with the area, the Boise River flows through downtown Boise and Garden City. The green belt is a walking, biking pathway that is paved that goes right next to the river. It was 3.15 a.m., February 2008, and I was scraping the ice off my car window. I had to be at work at 4 a.m. I realized that it was eerily quiet. I looked up, and I saw it walking along the green belt towards the Veterans Parkway Bridge. The bridge goes over the Boise River, and the green belt pathway goes underneath the bridge. It was tall, I would guess over seven feet. It turned its head and looked at me. It had green, neon-colored, glowing eyes. I said out loud, Oh my God! It turned its head back and continued walking along the green belt. It was walking slowly. I was frozen with fear and didn't move until I saw it vanish behind the building that is next to the Veteran Parkway Bridge. I assumed that it continued along the green belt under the bridge. It had dark brown fur all over its body, pointed ears, long snout, weird legs, and a tail. I got a pretty good look at it. That section of the green belt is at the end of a dead-end street and has a couple of businesses there with parking lots that are all lit up with street lights. I only saw it that one time. I wasn't there, but my son, son-in-law, and their friend saw a dogman. My son called me all freaked out that they had seen a Bigfoot because he knows I believe in Bigfoots. Now, my son always made fun of me for believing in Bigfoots. He asked me, Dad, can Bigfoots run on all fours? I said, yes. Why do you ask? And he said, Dad, we just saw one while out spotlighting rabbits. I asked him to describe what it looked like, and he said they were hunting rabbits with a spotlight, and he saw something hunched over. He said he then yelled to the others and let them know that he had seen something, and then started to shine his light on it. At first, he thought it was a large bird because it was down like it was eating something. Then it stood up on its hind legs and spread its arms out wide, and when the other two came to look at it, it dropped down and took off faster than anything they had ever seen before. He said it had a dog snout and was covered in fur, but you could see it was very muscular. My son is 6'2", and he felt it stood as tall or taller than him. When it took off, they ran after it and watched it jump and clear a huge rock pile in one leap, like nothing. That scared them, and they all ran back to their car to get out of there. I spoke to all three, and they all had the same story and described it the same way. I told my son that's not a Bigfoot, because Bigfoots don't have dog snouts. I told him, you saw a dog man. It's funny that this happened around a lot of cornfields. The area also had caves and was covered in sagebrush. My encounter happened a few years ago in South Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. Here in Louisiana, we call counties parishes, in case you didn't know. I was hunting deer or wild pigs one night, 
on a protection levee system that was built to protect the town from hurricane flood waters. As I walked to where the levee turns off to the left, there was a canal with woods that was about a hundred yards from some houses. To the left was a natural ridge that goes out into swamps and marshes. Well, as I made that turn from the ridge of oak trees, I heard a growl. I thought it might have been a coyote or a dog, so I walked slower. Then I heard brush and a smaller sized tree shake and another growl. I shined my light in the direction of the sound and saw a pair of eyes that were reflecting an amber yellow color. What surprised me was the fact that the brush was about six foot high and the eyes were about a foot above the brush. When I saw those eyes, I slowly backed up while keeping my light on the thing as I walked back to the turn to head back to my truck, which was parked about three quarter of a mile away. It came out of the woods. I lit the thing up with my light again. Now, I was probably thirty feet from it. I saw its whole body and face. The body was covered with black hair, with some brown mixed in. The hair was thickest around its head, neck, chest, and upper back. It looked a lot like a lion's mane, but wasn't as pronounced, since all of the hair was the same color. It had pointy ears, with a little bit of hair coming off the points, making the ears seem a little longer. It stood on two legs, but the legs were weird and backward-like. The arms were really long, longer than the legs. Its hands were like a mixture of human and bear, like really big raccoon front paws. It had paws, but it also had fingers. That's the only way to describe it. If you watch the movie The Howling, you'll get an idea of what this thing looked like. It's as if whoever made that movie knew something others didn't. Now, at this point, I was freaking out. So I pulled up my rifle. I hunt with a Romanian AK with a camo paint job I did myself. The way I was hunting wasn't exactly legal. That's why I took my Romanian AK. If I had to toss it, I wouldn't be out much money. The rounds I use are special rounds, made to hunt feral dogs. I've dropped deer and hogs with these rounds before. One shot, and they're done. But back to the story. As I pulled my rifle up to the ready, it growled and walked a few steps towards me. I fired a round right into its chest area. I knew I had hit it, because the creature took a step back. As it stepped back, I ran towards my truck. That's when I let out a loud growl and a howl like I had never heard before. I grew up hunting and fishing and thought I knew everything in the woods, but I hadn't heard anything like the sounds it made before. As I ran back to the truck, it stalked me but kept its distance. As I got close to the well-lit area where my truck was parked, by the town library and elementary school, it stopped following me. I tried to find anyone who may have had similar encounters in the area, but all I could find was old legends of the Rugaru, which is pronounced Rugaru. I told my grandpa about what had happened, but told him it was a friend who had told me it had happened to him. I also told him that it sounded like a crazy story to me. He told me when he was 17, in the exact same area, at night, hunting, he heard a howl like nothing he had ever heard before. He also told me that something had stalked him as he ran home that night. He said he had never saw what it was, but could hear it was following him through the brush and the swamps. That encounter has changed my life. My perception of what is real and what is not will never be the same again. I still haven't gotten over that night. I went back a few days after that incident and found two large dog tracks as big as my hand. I wear a size LG glove. It was the summer of 97, and I was 13 years old. I was rollerblading from a part of town called Old Cottage Grove. I guess I should start off by saying that the city where this happened was a suburb of St. Paul, Minnesota, called Cottage Grove. 
It was around 9.30 p.m. and I was rollerblading back home from a girlfriend's house with a friend. We were just coming around a bend in the road that went past a farm that I believe at the time was called Green Acres Farm. I'm not exactly sure what it was they did at that farm, but I do know for sure, at the time, there were always cattle of all different ages, sizes, and genders, which brings me to the conclusion that maybe I was just at the right place at the wrong time. As I was rounding the bend in the road to start coming up the hill, I felt a very strong sense of fear. It was like my body was telling me to get the heck out of there, yet I couldn't figure out why. I can tell you this much, though. For the first and only time in my life, I felt like I was no longer at the top of the food chain. Right when I started to pick up the pace to get out of there is when I heard a sound that came from the fenced-in cattle farm to my left, maybe 15 to 20 yards behind me. It sounded like nails grabbing a pole or fence and then was sounding like what a dog's paws and claws sound like when walking or running on a tile floor. Except this just sounded like a quick leap on the street's pavement. As I turned around to look, there stood what looked to be a wiry gray-haired werewolf. It was like time had stopped. There was a street light at the time in the woods, maybe five feet behind it, so all I could make out was a silhouette of this monster. It had to be at least seven feet tall, with the head of what looked like a German shepherd, with huge ears and a huge muzzle. I could see this thing was built like a bodybuilder, it stood bipedal, like a man, not like what some folks say with these things having dog-like limbs. It had long, slim hands with black nails on its fingertips. It had a slim waist, but its upper body was muscular beyond belief. The thing that always stuck with me, besides the point of seeing this thing in the first place, was that his head was turned to the side and snout up in the air. The one thing that really stuck out and was out of place to me was that I could see this thing breathe as though it was winter. But mind you, it was the end of June, almost July. It looked as though it was smelling my scent, but that's just what it looked like. I'm not positive on that. Before I knew it, I was yelling to my friend to get the heck out of there and not to look back, but it's almost as though he was in another world because he didn't seem to feel let alone see what I had just experienced. I'm somewhat of an artist and drew a picture of what I saw, which was a werewolf. Fast forward 17 years later, and I still hadn't told anyone about this encounter. That is, until my oldest brother and I were trading stories one summer evening, and it just sort of came up as we were talking about Bigfoot. Mind you, my brother's a firm believer in this animal, so I said the heck with it and started telling him about what happened to me, going to the point of pulling out the original drawing I drew of it. To my surprise, he didn't look at me or laugh at me like I was positive he would have. Instead, he started asking me if I had ever heard of the Michigan Dog Man or seen anything on it, which I replied no. He then pulled up an image on the internet of a sketch that an eyewitness had drawn, and I swear to you it sent shivers down my spine because it not only looked like my drawing, it looked exactly like the thing I saw that night in the summer of 97 in Old Cottage Grove, Minnesota. To this day, I still find myself trying to wrap my head around what I saw. I'm 33 years old now, yet still find myself trying to rationalize what I crossed paths with that night. It feels good to get this out there and somewhat off my chest. I hope someone finds something helpful in this experience, and I hope this sort of thing never happens again. On the night I had my brief encounter, it was unusually slow. During slow parts of my night, I park outside the facility that I work out of and watch the wildlife. It's abundant with a mixture of fox, coyotes, raccoons, and every once in a while, I'll spy a little red wolf breaking the wood line, trotting across an open field in search of small game. 
Our facility is located on a dead-end street, which backs up to a major creek, and to the left, we have a smaller creek that breaks off to the larger one. Both creeks are fed by a large river, about a mile away. I should also mention that we have large patches of woodland that lead to our facility, and that the area does not have a lot of light until you turn into the parking area. About a week prior to my encounter, I would sit at the end of the road to complete my paperwork and wait for the next call to come. As I parked there, I would get a sense of being watched. I would look up, almost expecting someone to be standing in front of my truck. Let me say that the darkness or the woods do not spook me, nor make me jumpy. I was raised in the swamp, close to a river, and rather enjoy the solitude. Not only did I have a sense of being watched and sharing my space with someone, I noted that there were no normal night sounds, such as crickets and frogs. I also found it baffling that all the wildlife seemed to be gone from the area. This really bothered me. I couldn't figure it out. On the night I had my encounter, I decided to leave some wet dog food at the edge of the wood line, hoping to entice a family of raccoons out, so I could at least see that they were okay. This family of raccoons I had watched grow up from kits, and not seeing them bothered me. Also, I didn't see a gray fox that would hang around that area. This fox would come within four to five feet from you, but would be guarded all the while. He would hang out with certain people and then retreat back into the woods. Anyway, I popped the top off some smelly dog food as I was pulling the top off the can. I heard a deep growl come from out of the edge of the wood line. I had never heard an animal growl with such force and so deeply. At first, I thought it could have been a jake break from the interstate. That can be heard from our facility, but that's not what it was. I could feel, hear it from the wood line, hitting my face and felt the growl inside of my chest, pretty much like a vibration. I knew this was not a bear, the same as someone knows their left hand from their right, you just know. And yes, we do have bear here, but I can tell you quite bluntly and very firmly, this was not a bear or any other wildlife that was normal to the area. I dropped my head down and refused to look up. I dumped the can of food on the ground with one hard thump, hoping whatever was in the woodline would rather have the can of food instead of me. I backed away with my head down until I reached my truck. My instinct told me to drive away, and so I did. About half an hour later I returned, due to my curiosity overruling my common sense. Being a natural skeptic, I was prepared to figure out the earlier event. I parked in the same place, and this time had walked to the back of my truck to smoke. While standing there, I observed a dark mass come across the road and disappear into an open field. That is mostly overgrown with wild blackberry bushes and grass. I have a trained eye. I take in a lot of detail, and still... I admit to suffering from short-term memory loss due to TBI that ended my law enforcement career. What I saw at that moment, though, will be in my memory forever. I can only describe this creature as what I took at the time to be kind of a hybrid. Although it was on all fours, to me it did not appear natural. It moved with very quick, fluent motions. Looking back, I was mostly surprised by the creature having the intelligence to attempt to appear natural. Something was off with its gait, though. It was kind of like the front legs were pulling its body forward. The back was hunched at the shoulders, and it had a long back. The creature was black, which I can only describe as a dark mass, with no reflection. I also noted it had a small animal in its mouth. The strange part was that I could see the definition of most of the small animal, compared to the darkness of the creature that I now believe to be a dog-man. The snout was long, but it fit its body. What struck me most were its ears. They were folded back like you might see on a Dutch Shepherd or a German Shepherd. I guess with my background, working with dogs, the ears were clearly defined to me. 
I can't say what kind of tail it had or what color its eyes were. I just know it was there one minute and gone the next. When daylight came, I looked for tracks, but listened to my gut and did not enter the field looking for it. The ground leading out of the smaller creek was covered in grass, and what dirt was there was hard. I was left baffled, but more amazed than anything. I sat on my experience for several months. I didn't tell anyone about it. I then started searching the internet for what I had seen. I guess, in my mind, I wondered if it was some type of hybrid created by man and had escaped. I found several sites on the internet, but none seemed to come close to what I had seen. Nothing until I came across a picture of a dog man. If you take what I saw and stand it upright, instead of being on all fours, well, that's what I saw. With a doubt, I'm pretty sure this dog man was a young adult, but it wasn't overly massive. What I ponder the most is the fact the dog man had to catch my scent before clearing the wood line. I know scent. I know how it works. The dog man knew I was there before coming out of the woods. I suppose that will be the answer I will never have. After a few months of keeping my experience to myself, I spoke with a few of my co-workers. Of course they told me it was a bear or a large wolf, but they did acknowledge that the wildlife had disappeared for a while. I was told to share my story, but I think it was only so my co-worker could get a good laugh at me behind my back. I stand by what I saw, although I don't speak about it much because of people like him. I have never been fascinated by Bigfoot or other similar creatures, although I did respond to a Bigfoot call off the record for a law enforcement friend, but at this point I am consumed with what I saw that morning and learning more about it. I am grateful that people are around for support for people like me. As I write this, I am once again on night shift, parked at the same spot where I had my encounter. I'm pretty sure that the dog man has left the area. Wildlife is back, and the night sounds are all around. I guess I will always wonder if it will come back again, but I can't say I will ever walk the woods at night again, looking for animal tracks myself. Thanks. My parents had a house in the countryside, in Styria. To give you a little layout of the area, we lived in a valley surrounded by other houses. The valley itself was surrounded by thick forest, and still is. There were two bigger roads you could take to leave the valley. One would lead to the city, the other one went down a hill to a small village. Both roads went through the forest. I was 15 at the time, and decided to spend the day at a friend's house in that village. I stayed a little longer than I usually would, and by the time I was ready to head home, it was dark outside. I had a mopped auto cycle at the time, which was really slow going up hills. So I rode out of the village and was riding over a bridge. Before I reached the end of the bridge, I thought I saw something to my right in the forest, but I figured it was nothing. Pressing on, I rode up hills on the road and continued through the forest. As soon as I passed the part where I thought I saw something in the forest, something stepped out of it. I couldn't see what it was because there were no street lights, but I had a bad feeling in my gut. I rode as fast as I could, around 21 miles per hour, and when I looked in the side mirror, I saw two yellowish eyes right behind me. Whatever it was followed me like that, halfway through, until we reached a fork where a farmer had cut a little path in the forest. The entrance to it is usually blocked, by a gate similar looking to a railroad gate. Whatever was following me just raced to this gate. It was way faster than my moped, jumped over it, and ran into the forest. We don't have bears or wolves here, and why would a deer follow me, let alone that close, maybe two feet away? Sadly, it wasn't my last encounter with this thing. It was 2.30 a.m., and another night of not being able to sleep due to back pain. 
I was lying on my side, reading, when my very close by neighbor's motion detector light turned on. This happens from time to time. When it turns on, it lights up the entire side of my house. We have lived here nine years, and I have never once seen anything walk past my bedroom window at night. Since I was facing my large bedroom window, the very bright motion detector light going off caught my attention. I looked up and saw the side silhouette of a dog man. I said, holy crap. It was walking past my bedroom window. I saw it from mid shoulders up. The shoulders were huge and its head was huge. It had pointed ears like a German shepherd dog and a long snout. Its mouth was slightly open as I saw a large tongue that seemed to be lolling to the side of its mouth. When I saw this creature and spoke those words, I could swear that that thing slowed down, smirked, and then kept going. That's all I saw that night. Last week, though, while in my bedroom again, I heard something huge land on the ground, behind my bedroom wall. That wall has no windows. I heard deep, kind of raspy breathing. I started praying pleading the blood of Jesus over my house, grounds around it and all. I do this most nights, but sometimes I forget. I'm awake most nights until 3 a.m. or later due to having severe spine issues, as well as fibromyalgia. We live in a lovely manufactured home community. There are lots of trees around here and it's very close to canals, large open fields, and woods. I know this is what I saw, but the fact that I saw it has left me amazed. Why is that, when so many are also seeing them? I guess I just thought since I am in the house most of the time due to my health, I would never see one. The space between my neighbor's house and ours is about ten feet. My husband went outside weeks later, once I got the courage to tell him this has happened, and measured the area by the window. That dog man had to be at least eight feet tall. What concerns me greatly is that no one in the police department or government will alert people to their existence. People are walking around feeling a false sense of security. I know I did. I won't even try to walk outside anymore. And yes, I have cautioned my neighbors, the ones with the security light. I can't think of any other details right now. But it's important for you to know that several years ago, a homeless woman was camping out down by the river here in Albany. She was found dead, and her tent was really torn up. I believe the police report in the newspaper said she was torn up as well, but I honestly can't remember any of the details. To the best of my knowledge, no one was ever caught for that crime. This is a sleepy town, just over 50,000 people. We no longer get the newspaper so I have no idea if this has happened again. I do know that a couple was down by that same area and saw a dog man. It really frightened them badly. I heard about that on another YouTube channel. I just want people to be aware so they don't go out at night anymore, especially near the river. But then, we're not near a river, and I saw one in the middle of the night. Thank you for reading this report and for doing all that you do make people aware of what is really going on out there. My brother and I were waiting for our bus at our usual corner stop. It's about three blocks away from our house and there's a pretty densely wooded creek nearly one to two blocks behind our bus stop. The first thing I noticed that was off was that my brother was standing completely rigid, staring intently down the long road. There are only two street lights and a few automatic porch lights down there. I shook him a little bit and asked him what he was looking at. He shushed me almost immediately. Then out of the corner of my eye, I saw a large, black shape darting on two legs across the street to the line of the houses on the other side before disappearing. Thankfully, our bus arrived soon afterward so we got out of there. I wanted to share a story of an encounter 
me and a bunch of friends had back in 1968. To this day, I still think about it. Kind of hard to forget no matter how hard I've tried. Anything I say today must be understood as the words of someone only 11 years old. But I'll try to make myself as clear as I can. On a summer evening in 1968, an older cousin, a group of friends, and I decided to play baseball at a nearby baseball field. The field was about four to five blocks away from where I lived, at 3621 Richmond Avenue, and the field was southeast from my house. Anyway, we all got together and were playing. There wasn't enough of us to play team-to-team -team matchup, so we were rotating one pitcher one fielder, and the catcher, while the rest batted. There are some train tracks that ran parallel to the baseball field. I mention this because of what happened next. My time came up to pitch, and my older cousin was fielding. One buddy hit a foul ball, and it went over the fence towards the railroad tracks. By then, it was getting a little past dusk. The field lights weren't too bad. There was a man standing close to where the ball rolled to a stop. My cousin ran towards the fence and yelled at the man to throw the ball back to us. He ignored my cousin, so I ran over and yelled as well. The rest of the guys came over and we started to cuss the guy out for ignoring us. None of us wanted to get near the guy though. Something about him didn't feel right. One of the guys picked a rock and threw it at what we thought was a bum. The rock came close, but didn't hit the guy. Then a group of guys started to throw rocks. That's when the crap hit the fan. This guy turned towards us slowly and dropped to all fours. What we all saw next, by the dim field lights, was not a man, but a snarling, wolf-like creature. My cousin was the first to react by yelling werewolf, and he turned and ran, followed by the rest of us. We ran as a group. Some were lucky and made it home first, peeling off from the rest of us one by one. My cousin and a friend ran to my house and spent the night. We told my parents what we had seen, and of course, they blew us off. My mom told us, what you probably saw was the devil himself for staying out past dusk. Being Hispanic, we always had holy water around the house. We blessed the house and especially my bedroom. None of us slept that night, and any noise would wake us up. The next morning, we, all the guys, screwed up enough courage to go back to investigate. We found our ball where it had landed, but no visible tracks of anything else. Everyone but me agreed that we had seen a werewolf. I kept asking how could it have been a werewolf if there was no full moon last night. Have dogmen sightings been reported near El Paso? The very few people I've told over the years have either laughed at me or thought I was crazy. I'm an old man now, but I needed to get this off my chest. I was out at my grandparents' house, hunting coyotes as usual this time of the year. I was hiking through my next door neighbor's land to get to the wood-covered area in the back. While I was hiking, I got the feeling I was being followed by something to my right. I stopped and switched the red tint on my headlamp to my spotlight, but didn't see anything. Then I switched back to my headlamp and pulled my rifle back up and continued my hike. It was 6.15 a.m. and the sun was just coming up. I was sitting in a hide I'd made the day before. That's when I saw something behind a group of trees on my left. It was crouched. I raised my rifle, looked through my scope, and froze when I saw the creature staring back at me. I panicked and fired a shot off. That's when it stood up and took off, deeper into the woods. I sat there probably another 25 minutes before I decided it was safe to head in and did so. Later that day, I grabbed my grandfather and we both went out to where I had seen the creature when it stood up on two legs and took off. We measured where I had seen it and it was roughly seven and a half feet tall. To this day, 
I'm terrified to go out at night or in the early morning hours. Back in 2004, my husband and I were given three of our grandchildren to raise. They were boys, aged one and a half, three, and four and a half years old. The boys were followed a few months later by their sister, a newborn, who was also given to us to raise. After having raised our children, my husband and I found ourselves as new parents. We lived in a small town in New England, so small that you could step out of the house and see the police station, fire department, and post office just beyond the house. When I was young, we had stop signs downtown where there are stoplights now. My grandmother and father were both born there and I lived for six decades in that town. It was the kind of place where, if you needed some vegetables for supper, you went to a neighbor who had a garden or took what you needed and left the money on the front porch. We lived on the main street, but were surrounded by many forested acres. Three rivers run through the town, and we had a large field behind our house. There were many fields throughout the town, and other towns nearby were similar in makeup. There were also farms in the area, and in the neighboring towns, too. They were very New England-type towns. Small, comfy, and cozy. When the children first came to live with us, both my husband and I worked. He worked at a transit company in a local city, and I worked as a paralegal. My job was a four-hour commute, two hours in the morning and two hours at night. I would be gone from the house for 12 hours a day at minimum. I often worked on weekends too. My husband took a leave of absence from his job and stayed at home with the children for two and a half years. When he returned to work, he worked the night shift. That enabled him to watch the children during the day. He did his best with the children while I was at work and given the circumstances he did a great job. One day after work, when the children were six and four respectively, I came home to find the house in a state of disarray. Supper hadn't been made, and the kids were running to me with quite a story about a big gorilla that had been outside that day. The two youngest let me know during the afternoon they saw a big gorilla in front of the house, running along the street. They said it was very fast. Then the big gorilla jumped our picket fence and ran into our yard. The children said that their noses was pressed against the window pane and that the big gorilla came up to the window, growled at them, and then pushed its paws against the window. The children said they tried to wake up my husband, but he had fallen asleep on the couch and they could not rouse him. The big gorilla then ran into the backyard where it broke some car windows and threw about some trash cans. I didn't disbelieve the children. I was just too exhausted to deal with it and responded with my that's nice comment that I used for anything I couldn't handle at the moment. I do recall reading in the newspaper a few days later that the police were warning folks about the vehicle damage, but I never gave that any further thought. I didn't give it any further thought even though a few years prior to the big gorilla incident I had seen a very large dead wolf that I presumed had been hit by a car laying on the roadside. It was not a coyote, nor was it a coy dog that we had in the area. I had seen pictures of wolves and this one was immense. I had personally seen coy dogs while riding my horse along the trails. The wolf body was gone the next day and no mention by authorities of any wolf sightings was in the newspapers. I thought that was sort of unusual. Did we have wolves in our area? Wouldn't that be newsworthy? Did anyone else see this wolf? Obviously, someone had, as its body was gone the following day. I also did not give the big gorilla story much further thought. Even though years before the children came, both my husband and I had witnessed large dog-type footprints in our backyard. 
We mentioned those prints to a friend of ours, the animal control officer in a nearby town, who didn't seem too impressed by our find. However, we never discussed anything further. I didn't give the big gorilla story much thought either, even though at about the same time we saw the dog prints on our backyard, our cats had started to go missing. I found one of our cats, Peter, the best hunter in town, high up on my neighbor's roof. The house was three stories with the first floor and second floor occupied by tenants, and the third, an attic. Lots of those older homes in New England always had full attics. I called Peter, managed to enter to the building, and climbed to the second floor with a closed basket. I climbed onto the porch railing, put the basket above my head, and up to the house gutters. And Peter obligingly dropped in. Thankfully, we managed to save our wonderful cat. Even though one of our friends asked why Peter was up on the roof, Peter was not scared of anything, but I was still not connecting the dots. When the children got a little older, we moved to North Carolina. It was in North Carolina when the children were nearer their teen years. I immediately spoke with our 12-year-old and 14-year-old separately. Do you remember the time you told me the story about the big gorilla? The 12-year-old energetically told me every single thing she remembered. The animal was very large and very fast. It had black hair and a long bushy tail. It growled. It had paws with fingers. It had stood up and pushed on the window with those paws. It ran very fast and had jumped over the fence. It had ran into the backyard and made a lot of noise breaking things. The 12-year-old said it did not have the face of a gorilla or a monkey, but she couldn't tell more about the face because of the hair. The 14-year-old shivered when I asked if he remembered it. He said he would never forget that thing coming into the yard. He remembers it clearly as if it were yesterday. He too remembers the swiftness of the creature, the black hair on it, and how it had jumped the fence and was running amok from the front to the backyard. He said he doesn't know what it was and still doesn't, but that he hopes never to see anything like it again. The children now know about dogmen, Bigfoot, and other cryptids. They didn't when they saw the big gorilla, though. Neither did I. We've all received an education. We're aware that dogmen don't always stay in the forests. They're often seen among neighborhoods. And perhaps, just perhaps, the creature my children saw all those years ago was just that. A dogman in a small New England town. I'm reporting a possible dogman sighting, based on the info provided by my son and his friend. This occurred in Montgomery, Massachusetts. As a four-wheel enthusiast, my oldest son has become familiar with off-roading trails and rural routes that he and his friends use regularly, often at night. On this occasion, they were in his Ford Explorer, following a familiar route in a rural town through a remote wooded area. Being winter, the plows stopped at a certain point, leaving a bank of snow at that point, marking where the town abandoned maintenance of that unpaved road for the winter, leaving further use of this road to those who dare. As my son related, he four-wheeled through the snowbank and drove along the road, which winded over a mountain. He concentrated on his driving, focusing on the road as his close friend sat in the front passenger seat. Suddenly, his friend exclaimed, Look! Look! What's that? What is that? My son didn't lift up his eyes to see it because he wanted to stay on the road. His buddy pointed to where it went, so my son quickly swung his truck around and illuminated the area with his off-road lights and headlights. His friend described what he saw as a running-like wolf, but not a wolf. He said it was a big like bear, but not a bear. He also said it had long hair and was lighter in color than a brown bear. He said it was gray in color. They sat there for a minute or so, staring into the darkness. Suddenly, 
something pushed the SUV from behind, making it slide along the muddy snowy road a short distance. They both whipped their heads around, only to see the blackness of night out the rear window. Then he quickly started the truck and sped out of there, not seeing the creatures again. My son stated that it could not have been the same creature his buddy spotted, because once he had illuminated the area with the truck's lights, they would have spotted movement against the white snow background. Another of my son's friends insisted this was a Bigfoot, as he had an encounter years ago, but this description seems to better fit a dog man. This experience, whatever it was, is absolutely true. I was driving home from work on a six-lane highway, heading west into Hamilton, Ontario. As I drove on my side of the highway, I saw a dog cross from the left side to the right. The area is full of trees, bushes, channels, and ravines of water that are offshoots of Lake Ontario. When I saw the dog, it was approximately half of a kilometer ahead of me. The astonishing aspect of this dog, I'm certain it was a dog, was that its length from nose to rump, excluding its tail, covered almost the full width of the lane, eight feet. Where it was heading was back into a small valley, filled with heavy forestation and a ravine. I couldn't believe a dog could grow to that size. I still remind my boyfriend of this occasionally. I have no witnesses. When I was out on a walk in the woods, close to my house, I heard a strange noise coming from the woods. When I looked, I saw an about 2.5 meters high creature, standing on two legs like a human, but the body was covered with fur and had a head like a dog. I directly started to run and did not stop until I was safe at home. When I ran, I heard that the creature was following me but it stopped after a few hundred meters. I had just gotten off a bus at the train station and was walking through a small shortcut. As I was walking down the street, I noticed someone at the end of that street, standing in the dark, watching me. I didn't think much about it, not at that time. I checked my phone for the time and saw that it was 11.06 p.m. When I looked back up, I noticed two pairs of glowing yellow, gold-like eyes. Then I remembered that I had seen someone or something in that spot before. I stopped walking so I could get a better look at it, and suddenly it went down on all fours and ran off. I could feel my heart beating and my fear rising. I waited for a minute to calm down. After that, I went on walking and looked back at my phone. It was 11.08 p.m. When I looked back up, I saw it was running back to the edge of the footpath I needed to use to cross the street. When I first saw it, it was on all fours. It then started to stand on two feet and was watching me. I could feel its eyes staring at me. Then a few seconds later, as I was still walking, trying to act like I couldn't see it, it went back down on all fours and ran down the road I needed to use to get home. As I rounded the end of the street, I could see it running down the side of the road, heading towards the forest. I haven't heard a lot about encounters in Norway, Scandinavia, not even Europe, but here is mine. A little background info. I'm a 27-year-old guy from Norway who lives in the western part of Norway. I work and have a girlfriend. I'm 194 centimeters tall, or 6 foot 4 in the US, 230 pounds, fairly athletic and not scared of much here in life, but that night, I got incredibly scared. I haven't walked, camped, 
or done anything in the woods here since. I have been in the woods since, but not in this particular part of the country. I have always loved the forest. It's so quiet. I love being alone. If I have spare time, I always like to do things outside, whether it be fishing, jogging, playing soccer, basketball, hiking, or whatever. Now on to the encounter. The day was very normal. It was a Saturday afternoon. I had packed my tent and some food and was heading to the local mountain for a one-night camping trip. It wasn't a very difficult hike, but it was a very steep one. After two to three hours, even though I'm in a respectable shape, I am heavy and long. I was pretty tired. I didn't have any mobile phone or clock with me, but my best guess is that the time was around 8 p.m. or so. It's not that easy to guess the time, since the sun is up almost all day and all night when it's summertime in Norway. It was a nice and clear Norwegian evening. It was typical summer weather. I made a fire and cooked some food. I had a couple hot dogs and a pack of marshmallows with me. After a couple of hours, I had eaten my food. Actually, I felt a little sick, because I ate probably ten to too many of the marshmallows. I had enjoyed my meal and taking in the heat of the fire, thinking what a lovely evening it was. Eventually, it started to get somewhat dark. I'm going to say the time was probably around 11 p.m. I had planned to kick back and read, but it became a little too dark to do that. Sure, I could see all and around me, but it became a little hard on the eyes to concentrate on the letters. I probably was a little too tired also. Suddenly, I heard a noise from a bush to my right. I turned to look in that direction and saw it just standing there. It was standing to my right and kind of ahead of me. I've listened to reports and they all say it's some big seven and nine foot monster of a beast. This one really wasn't that big. I would say it was six feet at the most, but it shook me hard. In one moment, I was enjoying a nice evening by myself, and then the next moment, I felt extremely startled. It was breathing heavy, like a very tired man, but it sounded animal-like, wild and weird. It sounded like it had throat problems or slime in its throat, or something. I really don't know how to describe it with writing. I was still sitting at this point and just looked at it. I believe I was actually frozen in fear. I have never, ever encountered anything other than a deer in these woods. The most dangerous animal we have in this area is probably a fox. The creature was frozen as well, it was standing on two legs, with its arms down, at its sides. I can't say how many seconds we both stayed like this, of course. It felt like forever, an eternity. I couldn't see its eyes because they were dark, and kind of in the shadow of its brow, or sockets. And it also had some hair, but its head was fixed on me. That I could tell. I was just sitting there, paying attention to what it was doing. I didn't utter a word at it, or yell. It just wasn't something I considered doing. I was afraid of making the first move. Now you know how a cat slowly moves its paws ahead when it thinks it's safe or when it thinks its prey isn't paying attention. Well, to me, that was what it started doing. The incident ended with me throwing a handful of red-hot glowing sticks from the fire at it. When I did that, it bolted. I will tell more if you contact me. I was on patrol as a deputy sheriff for the county and was usually assigned to the Highway 13 and 30 corridors. However, I recall that particular July 1st, however, because a young man, 16 or 17 years old at the time, had been sucked into a storm drain which emptied into Cedar Lake 
near the Quaker Oats plant. This is a place with heavy foot traffic and located in an urban setting. The area is also bordered by Mohawk Park. As the search went on into the night, the local PD got the county involved. I parked my cruiser at what I believe was the electric company storage yard. The yard had what I estimated to be a 10-foot fence that ran parallel to a paved bike trail on the other side, of which runs a large concrete spillway to siphon off flood waters. I arrived at what I estimate to be roughly 11.30 p.m. or 11.45. I estimate only because I assure you there will never was nor will be an official statement on record with my name on it telling this story. As I left the lot, I was at the north end of the lake and headed west on foot. There was a lot of brush and saplings between the spillway and trail, so I proceeded on to the point that the trail turned south near where Cedar Lake empties into the Cedar River, under the railroad tracks leading into Quaker Oats. There are multiple tracks at the turn I mentioned before, and only the track furthest from myself had a train on it. With my attention on the spillway, I hardly noticed at first a faint red-colored light a distance north from my position. It was coming down the track on the other side of the train, I had thought it perhaps the tail lights of a car not being from the patrol route. I had no knowledge that there was, in fact, no road in that direction. There ain't much things in the world that scare me. Put simply, I've seen some shit in my fucking days, but nothing prepared me for that night. The lights disappeared, and that was that, or so I had figured. About five minutes have passed before I hear a snorting, almost sniffing sound coming from the other side of the tracks. When I turned, the first thing I saw were the eyes. They glowed a dull red. The thing was at least eight foot tall, pushing 450 pounds. I judge this by the fact that I am 6'4", and weigh around 280. I turned to my light, and to this day wish I hadn't. It had pointed ears and a long muzzle, and it looked me right in the face before it bolted into the timber. It was not a mask, and it was not a person in a costume. Who would walk up on an armed man with a police radio in full uniform and risk getting shot? I remember it was surreal. So final, I guess. I know what's in the dark now. People can say or think what they want, but even with a chambered round and full magazine and a Glock 40, it didn't feel like enough power. I unholstered and fell back towards the trail and to the electric company storage yard. Putting the fence to my back, I made a hasty retreat to the lot where my cruiser laid. I don't think I holstered my pistol until I got out of the park. I never spoke of it then and honestly don't know why I am now. But one thing is for certain. It knew I was there, and it was watching my every move. I'll never go back, and I no longer work with the department since becoming a minister. But I still carry a Glock with hollow point rounds tipped with silver if, and I rarely do, leave my home at night. I was 14 years old and lived in central Louisiana at the time. My mother had always been interested in the paranormal. She'd buy copies of UFO magazines and watch documentaries on Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster, etc. So I just grew up being interested in things like that, at face value. I always believed in them, but I never had any inkling that werewolves, dogmen, or whatever could possibly exist. Anyway, I lived in a mobile home park, which was on a two-lane highway, Highway 28 East to be exact. It was a long street with a cul-de-sac type of dead end. At the dead end, to the left, was the only brick home in the park. Straight ahead, 
was thin woods and several trails going off in every direction. To the right, slightly, was a deep ditch that people had dumped junk and trash in, like old washing machines, broken laundry baskets, or whatever. A thin metal wire fence ran from the ditch across into the woods and out of sight. We, the kids in the neighborhood, had what we called a club, where we would all gather together and hang out. Some of us had gathered busted or discarded dining room chairs and placed them in the center of what was the thinnest areas of the trees. I had come there to figure out where to put everything. Beyond the deep ditch, further into the woods, was a small stream with hills on each side. An enormous old oak tree had fallen beside the stream on the side I was on. I spotted an old metal folding table near the stream and went down to inspect it. I thought it would be a good item to put in the center of the chairs. It seemed to be in good condition, so I decided to head home. I figured I'd get it the next morning. The next morning, I made my way toward the metal wire fence, which somehow, I don't know why, had been bent on both its top and bottom inwards toward the center of the fence. I was about to duck under it when I heard the distinct sound of sniffing, so I turned to see what it was. Standing on the other side of the stream was a seven to eight foot tall creature, sniffing the air. Its head was turned slightly. The first thought that entered my mind was, Oh my God, werewolves are real. It stood on two powerfully built muscular legs, which ended in enormous paws. It had no tail. It had a massive chest, as well as extremely muscular arms and hands. The hands seemed to have the same kind of pads that a paw has, but they were arranged differently. It had a wolf-like head and tall pointed ears. The eyes glowed red. The ears were in proportion to the head. It had a snout or muzzle. It kept sniffing the air as it stepped over the tree trunk like it was nothing. I would have had to physically climb it to get over it. I thought it was coming after me. It stopped and seemed to be breathing or panting. But there was this deep rumble that accompanied it. I decided to get out of there before it did see me and ducked up under the fence. I ran to my bike which was parked off the road and pedaled my butt home. I never went into those woods again. Not after that. About a month and a half to two months later, we moved to Mississippi. It wasn't until many years later that I discovered the term dogmen. It scared me, but also started me on my fascination with ancient myths, legends, werewolves, and many other non-Bigfoot cryptids. I had been up all night at a friend's house in the town of Trivi playing video games. I didn't want to sleep there, so I said goodbye and headed home. I knew my car was making a funny noise, but I thought surely I could get home. Well, I was driving down a long, dark stretch of highway with nothing but forest and a few sparse country houses. I was coming up to the top of a long hill when suddenly my car stops and it starts pulling forward. The engine revved, but no gears would engage. My CV joint just went out. I was hoping that wouldn't happen. Well, I had no way of getting it home now. So I backed up, down the road, in neutral, and off, onto a side road. I thought about staying and sleeping in the car, but something told me not to do that. I had an eerie feeling of being watched. So I grabbed my video game case and my machete that I had made from a lawnmower blade and started walking. I kept noticing the feeling of being watched and I felt like I was being followed. 
I kept looking behind me and saw nothing. But when a car passed by, heading in the direction behind me, it illuminated the area with its headlights, and I saw something behind me, in the ditch, hunched down low. It was huge, and I could tell it looked like an animal, but had humanoid features. It seemed to have arms, but its head was most definitely canine. Its head was very large, and its eyes glowed red when the lights hit them. Well, I've seen enough werewolf movies to know that this wasn't a good situation. So I started running. That probably wasn't the best choice, because I know that predators like to chase things that run from them. When the car had passed, the creature had darted into the trees. I thought that was the best time to run, so I did. I ran for about a quarter mile and looked back, but didn't see anything, so I kept walking. Well, I kept checking behind me and off to the side, where the tree line was. I knew it was still out there, and probably following me, and yes, I was afraid, but I was also prepared to defend myself with my machete, if need be. I came up onto another hill and saw a farmhouse, off into the distance, to my left down a long, dirty driveway. The moon was almost full, and the area around the house was clear, so I could see a guy out there, messing with his truck as I walked by. Then he turned on a spotlight on his truck and spotted me with it. I kept walking, because his property said no trespassing and many out there wouldn't hesitate to unload on a strange trespasser. I knew it was close again, possibly closer now, and I was about to turn around and face it when another car came over the top of the hill and passed by me, going behind me again. I followed with my eyes and noticed this time it was a cop, so thinking quickly, I dropped my machete on the edge of the grass and waved. As he passed, his lights hit the ditch as well, and I saw that the dog man was very close, but it darted into the trees again when the light hit it. Thankfully, a moment later, the cop stopped and turned around. He came back and asked me what I was doing out there, so I told him what had happened with my car. I didn't mention the dog man, though. He may have thought I was crazy, but I asked him for a ride home, and he agreed after wanting to go check and make sure my car wasn't blocking the road. After we checked it, he agreed to take me home. I don't know what might have happened that night if he hadn't shown up, and it was the only time I was genuinely happy to see a police officer. My grandfather told me this story when I was a teenager. I'm 52 now. My granddad grew up in the woods of central New Brunswick, in a very remote area where only survivalists go now. Their whole family lived out in the sticks. They lived by hunting, fishing, trapping, and some logging. Granddad said when he was a teenager, he and his older brother Duke were up in the early hours checking trap lines on an old motorbike. It was early fall. Frost was on the grass and early morning mists still hung around the forest edges. He was rolling cigarettes with his brother and they were out of matches. So they dipped a bunch of cloth in the gas tank and ignited it off the coil wire while Duke kicked the bike over. The sound of a bike being kicked over without an ignition is sort of like an animal call. That's how my granddad described it. Anyways... Just as they started smoking their cigarettes, my grandfather noticed something bounding through the tree, coming towards them. Granddad said it ran in a way a bear did, but it stopped several yards away from them and stood up on its hind legs. It was still too far away to tell what it was, but they assumed it was a black bear because they are very common in New Brunswick. That's when it began walking upright towards them. As it got nearer, my granddad said it looked like a huge werewolf. His family origin was German, so this was not unknown. It got as close as 20 feet away from them, and then began to eye them closely. 
It sniffed their smokes and then turned and hopped or ran back to the trees. Grandad said they were not scared. He said they were only shocked that such a creature was living in the woods. Grandad said it was taller than any man, had a huge head, evil eyes, long and upright ears, hands with long claws, and had hair all over its body. I can't remember what color he said its fur was, but he said it had wolf-like legs. Anyways, that was his story, and he had many more. My first encounter happened late at night, while driving home to Snohomish from Sultan, the two towns being about ten miles apart. I was with my mother, and we had just finished dropping a friend off at her home in Sultan. It was late October, and there was an unusual storm going on that night that everyone talked about the following day. Tremendous cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning, and a very cold, dry wind with no rain. Bright flashes of light, loud thunder, and lots of leaves blowing around. After dropping our friend off, we were on a stretch of the road that's very dark, with farmland on either side of the highway, and both sides having densely wooded hills. We were driving a 91 Honda Accord, and at this one particular spot in the road, something caught my eye, off to the left side, which was a farm field, and there was a break in the guardrail for a dirt road going into the field. Right when we were even to this break, I saw what looked like a huge dog coming up, and right then, it ran in front of our car, and I hit it. We could see the top of its back, which we both swear looked more like a hyena at this point than a dog. It had to be huge to see its back over the hood of the car when you're sitting pretty low to the ground in a Honda Accord. Its fur was shaggy brown and mottled with dark spots, just like a hyena, and its front seemed higher up than its back. The headlights lit it up as it ran right in front of our car, and we could feel it get hit but didn't see it go either up in the air or off to the right side of the car. It was running from the left side of the highway to the right. We were driving westward. It sent my car into an uncontrollable swerve back and forth into the oncoming lane, and I just prayed that I could get it under control to keep from getting into a head-on collision with what looked maybe like a Ford Aerostar van. A calmness came over me, and I felt like my guardian angel had taken control of the steering, because we missed the van by just a few inches. After going a little ways further, we were both so shook up I pulled off to the side of the road. My mother wanted to go look for the dog, because we both love animals and felt bad about hitting something. But, I had a bad feeling about looking for this so-called dog, because it had looked so strange and I was afraid of it. It was dark and stormy. It didn't feel safe, and I just wanted to get home. We got back in the car and stopped at a little gas station. When we first got into Monroe, which is the next town between our town and Sultan, we got out to look at the front of my car, thinking surely there would be some evidence of hitting something that large. We were going to the highway speed when we hit it, which is 60 miles an hour like a dent, some fur or blood, but there was nothing there, not a scratch. The whole thing had a very supernatural feel to it. The look of this dog, which was huge and looked more like a hyena, just didn't seem right. Neither did the timing of it running in front of us, like it wanted to make a stop on that dark stretch of road and get out of my car, which we did but we got right back in. I never saw it on two legs. It ran on all fours. But there was something so calculated about the way it came up to the highway and looked at our car and ran in front of it. It seemed planned. It was such a strange electromagnetic type of storm that night, too. The next day, people we knew that lived miles and miles apart in many different directions all talked about the storm and one particularly loud thunderclap that shook everyone's homes. They all thought it was directly over their house,
but they were all miles apart. I have three more encounters which occurred after this first one. I'm pretty sure this happened in October of 97, no later than 98. It was later in the evening when I was driving back to my in-law's house by myself and was going down a dirt road. I saw something in the ditch up ahead and on the right and didn't really know what it was until I got up far enough so that my headlights could catch it. I didn't know anything about dogmen, not up until a couple of years ago. This thing had an outline of a huge dog, but when I got closer, it turned and looked at me. I just floored it. It didn't really bother me until I noticed it looking at me, and I saw that it was actually grasping what it was eating. I got back and didn't exactly say what I saw. I just asked them if there were any big dogs or wolves up where they lived. My father-in-law just laughed and said, No. Then he asked why. I didn't say anything. The thing I will never forget are the reddish-orange eyes that just kept staring at me. I never saw it. But in 1975, I was newly married, about 21 years old, and had a small baby. My sister, who was a teenager, was visiting us. My husband, my sister, and I had all gone to our bedrooms to settle down and go to sleep. I would say it was around 11 or 12 at midnight. We were just starting to relax and get sleepy when, out of nowhere, there was this horrible, loud, how? I mean, it was so loud it made my chest vibrate and my ears hurt. The sound was not human, but had a guttural human-like mix with what sounded like a wolf. We were living in a mobile home at the time, and it howled just outside our back door in the hallway near our bedroom. We jumped out of bed, looked at each other, and both said at the same time, What the hell was that? My husband was ten years older than I was, and was an avid hunter. He wasn't the kind of guy to scare easily. His face drained of color. My sister came running down the hallway, white as a ghost, and said, What was that? I told her I didn't know. My husband said he was getting his rifle and grabbed it out of the closet. He opened up the back door and yelled out into the wind, You better get the fuck out of here or I will blow your head clean off. He listened a moment before I yelled at him to please shut the door. He did and we never heard any more after that. Needless to say, we stayed up all night, afraid to go to sleep. I have never forgotten that howl. There is no way it was a dog or coyotes. I have heard both howl. It wasn't a guy joking around either. It was so loud there's no way a human could have made that sound. My encounter happened in February of 2009. In November 2008, I broke my arm and was basically stranded at home. I was unable to drive or work and was going stark raving mad with boredom. My best friend would drive the 35 miles north from Muskegon to pick me up in Shelby just to take me back to Muskegon for a visit at her home. She'd take me to dinner or out to see a movie, only to deliver me home to Shelby, after whichever activity. It was truly a selfless act of love. One night, she was driving me home. It was very late, well after 11 p.m. We were on US 31 northbound, around the Rothbury area of Oceana County, on the expressway. Being February in Michigan, the roads were naturally snowy, with scattered patches of ice and bare pavement. There was a small pickup truck in front of us, about five car lengths ahead of her car, when all of a sudden we saw something on two legs dart out from the left, just in front of an overpass. It ran across the two-lane highway and hit the back of the small pickup in the rear quarter panel, causing the pickup to fishtail. Luckily, the driver of the small pickup regained control, but
but they didn't stop to see what collided with their truck. If anything, it seemed to pick up speed and get the heck out of there. My friend and I watched in utter astonishment as the creature finished running to the right and disappeared into the weeds and trees along the highway. It didn't even break stride after it hit the truck. We looked at one another, sat in silence for a moment, and then I said, Did you see that? She said, Yeah, I saw it. We finished the ride to my house in silence, both lost in our thoughts. It looked like a giant dog or a wolf. It was on its hind legs, not all fours, and it was at least seven feet tall. It had pointed ears, a kind of mane around its neck, much like a lion's mane. It was dark in color, and its hind legs looked like a dog's, which was even more pronounced, as it was running only on its hind legs. Its front legs were freely swinging as it ran, and it seemed to have its mouth slightly open. It had an elongated face, very much like a collie face, and a long nose protruding from its face. Its face was covered by longish hair. The entire creature seemed to be covered in long hair, but I can't recall if it had a tail. Something tells me it did, but I can't recall for certain, so I don't want to say it did, when in fact I'm not sure. We thought perhaps it may have been one of the Michigan dogmen that are said to be in our area. Being a former Native American area, we have heard the stories but never met anyone that had a first-hand encounter. It was always someone who knew someone who knew someone who saw something. But now, my best friend and I definitely saw it. We had a first-hand experience. Our encounter was brief and over in a matter of mere moments. But it was front and center of us and we saw it clear as a bell.